right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Hope everyone had a great holiday season. Uh, I know we're excited to be ramping up events for 2023. If you haven't visited our site recently, do take a few moments to do so. We have a crazy amount of live events coming up, uh, including some live events um, with South African penguins in South Africa. On Friday, we will be live with Fabian Cousteau uh, and his Ocean Learning Center as they uh, bring their 100,000th turtle egg to their sea turtle hatchery uh, in Nicaragua. So we have a ton of amazing live events coming up. Take a look at the website and get in on some of that action. Now, today we have a really exciting event. We are reconnecting with Erdin Arush. So Erdin, as many of you may already know, we've been following his westbound rower journey as he traveled from California across the Pacific Ocean uh, and ended up in the Philippines. So in the process of doing this, he became the first person to cross the Pacific in a, uh, an ocean rowboat and doing that north of the equator, which is a pretty amazing feat. So we've been lucky enough to kind of talk to Aaron throughout the entire journey. In California, before he left, we caught him in Hawaii uh, when he stopped there a few times via satellite phone, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, in Guam, uh, in the Philippines when he, he completed that journey. So it's been amazing to be able to follow along uh, with that entire journey. And so today he is back in the Philippines and we're going to talk a little bit more about how the journey continues. I'm so excited. So let's bring Erdin in live with us right now. Hey, Erdin, how are we doing today? I am doing well, Joe. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And it's great to have you. I know it's probably about 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, in the it Philippines is. right now. So I'm yep. sure you've had a busy day preparing. Uh, yes, I am packing. I had organized piles everywhere, which is my mode of operation ahead of any departure. And uh, my bicycle is just on, out in the hallway. I'm in a hostel here. And we will start bicycling at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. All right. Well, I, we're not going to keep you up too long. Thank you so much for joining us today. What I'm going to do is... A shout out to all the classrooms on YouTube. I see we've got a group hanging out on YouTube. So let us know where you're joining us from and send in your questions when the time comes. But I thought what could be fun, Erdin, is you sent me a few images and video clips. So let's talk yes. a little bit about the journey so far and then what's coming up. So just give me a second here to share my screen and I will open the photos. So I think this is kind of a fun spot to start. This yes. is what you've done so far. Uh, and what a what a, a crazy journey it is, that line stretching from uh, <laughs> California to the Philippines. Yes, if we look at the longitudes of my starting point at Crescent City and where I ended up in Lagos being the Philippines, uh, it's about 120 degrees of separation, which is about a third of the globe, if you think about it that way. Yeah. Pacific is a huge ocean. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think it's only fair that we show a few images of your ride, your mode of transportation, your human powered uh, machine. Uh, yes. Tell us a bit about the boat. Uh, my rowboat is a plywood construction rowboat. It is a it's known as an ARR class rowboat, uh, Atlantic Rowing Race class rowboat. This boat was the standard used in the Atlantic rowing races from 97 until about 2004 when they went to molded composite hulls. So I bought this boat used. It was built in 2001 and uh, a, a British team of two men built it. It was named Kaos across the Atlantic from Canary Islands to Barbados. And then a mother-daughter British team also took it across the ocean. Same route in 2004, and I got it from them. With this rowboat, I registered 1,084 days at sea, which is wow. the current Guinness World Record for a solo rower. Absolutely amazing. And, you know, I want, if you can, after this event, students, uh, maybe your teacher can pull it up for you, is go to Google Earth online and look at the Pacific Ocean. And if, if you look at it right in the center, it's pretty much all you see is ocean, if you're looking at that view. Uh, and just, you know, Erdin, imagine, I mean, you don't have to imagine, but the students, what it's like to be in that little rowboat. I think it's around 21, 23 feet, something like that. 24 feet. 24 yes. feet. And, and that is your home as you're making yeah. 
cross. I have a cabin in the back where I can hide in bad weather and inclement weather, and I also use that where I as uh, as my sleeping quarters. And all my electronics are in there as well, keeping it uh, from weather. The deck is open. There is no superstructure to this so that if the boat does roll, it doesn't get caught upside down. It needs to keep rolling. There's ballast under my rowing seat. About 100 liters of uh, fresh water is in canisters down there, jerry cans. And also I have another uh, 50 kilos of lead shot at the very bottom as a keel. So it has 150 kilos of ballast built into this to make it come upright. The cabin doors and hatches have to be closed for it to have buoyancy to ride itself. So that's a must. I must be careful with that in heavy weather. Um, it has uh, three rowing stations. It's built for two people. If both were rowing, it would be the fore and aft positions. I typically use the aft position or the middle position, depending on how the wind is blowing. The farther aft I am, the more downwind uh, this boat wants to run. Uh, it has better leeway, we call it. All right, we've got a couple more pictures here. So kind of just some some pictures out on the ocean and, and this light, is that so, you know, if, if another ship is nearby, it can see you? Yes, this is the navigation light that I am displaying. It's a 360 degree visible bright LED light. Uh, typically, a, a vessel needs to display this from when it's at anchor. But since I am moving so slow, I might as well be at anchor. Sure. Uh, so for faster moving vessels, it just means that they should avoid me. It's a clear signal to them. This is... Uh, sunrise just short of guam actually uh i took 80 days to get to hawaii from crescent city another 129 days from there to guam then 30 days to legaspi in the philippines all right so this is sunrise is this next one is this a sunrise or a sunset this is sunrise i was heading west so my stern is to the east typically. all right so i bet you saw <laughs> A lot of beautiful sunrises, a lot of beautiful sunsets. Uh, and then you probably had your share of maybe some uncomfortable weather as well. Yes, I did. In fact, I had a nasty knockdown in December that came, uh, a big wave came from my port side uh, at while I was sleeping. Anticipating bad weather, I had tied myself on the mattress so I wasn't thrown at the ceiling. So the boat was tipped and then shoved. It was tipped about 120 degrees and shoved. So that caused some damage and uh, created uh, some uh, worry and anxiety at the time. And I lost one oar to that uh, calamity, I should say. I had to send it off to the bottom because it was caught outside the boat, knocking against the boat and I couldn't bring it up and I just could not hang out there with the cabin door open. So I pulled the knife and cut the last string that was holding it and let it go. Uh, sometimes one has to make such choices. All right. Well, I want to switch gears here and share a little video clip you sent me, just uh, a little rowing clip. So I'm going to load that up here right now. It should pop up momentarily. You're rowing, Erden. It's you in the ocean. I mean, what are you thinking about? What's kind of what's what's on your mind when you're just making your way? Nothing but blue. Well, the mind is uh, has no boundaries. Right? It can wander. So I can think of the past, deal with the past, plan the future, come back to the moments. As you can see, as I'm rowing, my eyes always off to my left side, my starboard side in this case, uh, looking over my shoulder to the waves that were coming. So this was, uh, again, between Hawaii and Guam when I was getting a whole lot of swells from the northwest and north trying to push me south. And I was trying to go west toward Hong Kong. So I always think about what the waves are doing, how they're arriving. It, but then it is much like riding a bicycle. One doesn't really think about it as it's happening. It's then it's on an automa automatic 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, and then uh, that leaves a lot of room to ponder about everything and anything. So I talk, I think about what my next blog entry should be about, what email I should be sending, what message I should be sending, who should I contact, uh, do we need to plan ahead, who needs to know my approach, uh, those kinds of things. So approaching Guam was challenging. We had to negotiate with the Air Force while they had a live fire exercise for me to approach Guam. So that was fun. <laughs> wow. Uh, all right. Well, a couple more pictures and then we'll let the classrooms take over. So, you know, you mentioned that Hawaii was your first stop after you left California. So here's a great shot of you uh, making your way. I think it was Waikiki. Yes, I pulled into Waikiki Yacht Club. Yes. All right. And then after that, uh, I believe you had some friends who joined you at different stages. Yeah. This red-footed booby came and landed on my oar, which was tied as I was resting. So I saw it. And as the boat was swaying, the first thing these birds do when they land is to uh, settle and then preen themselves. And, of course, they have to poop as a <laughs> requirement. So this one was off uh, on the handle of the oar. And I was watching it as the boat swayed each time it reached for a spot to scratch on its neck. It had to put its foot back down because the boat was moving. So I, I saw that this thing needed help and I reached over and scratched its neck and then it came closer. Then it became my friend. It was hanging out on the boat for five days with me. It would fly off, hunt some fish, come back. They feed on flying fish and it would come back and rest on the boat and eventually it took off. All right. Uh, great to have some company for a few days, I'm sure. Oh, yes. And then, so here we are now. This is, I believe this is where you are now. It looks like an absolutely beautiful spot. It is a beautiful spot. This is Le Gaspi. This is the uh, boulevard, they call it. That's Mount Leon in the background. It's an active volcano. It steams at the very top. It did have a couple eruptions uh, recently. Uh, nothing big, but enough to uh, worry that they don't allow hikers up the mountain anymore. Uh, so this is a an east-facing gulf. It's called the Albay Gulf. And at the west end of this is Legaspi. It's open to uh, trade winds. It, it is a beautiful spot, though. It is uh, definitely a spot to visit. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that volcano in the background is just like you're – textbook photo for a volcano i mean oh yes the way it rises this, the, the steam and this area in uh, the months of february march april uh is home to whale sharks they come and hang oh, wow. out by the shore and uh they have little sailboats here the puro sailors they call them this is the puro, puro beach uh, they launch those from the alba yacht club where my boat is sto stored if you look at this picture on the left you see a little green area just past this roof a tin roof and that green area is actually the shed under which is my robo all right i think we do have a photo so, of that too they built a nice there you go shed for you <laughs> yeah so we took this boat on land put it on four truck tires like this and that's how i left the boat and then they built a shed over it we're going to have to lift this and inch it forward out of un from under that shed yeah. and then lift it and put it on a flat bed to take it up to northwest corner of Luzon Island before I can row to Vietnam across the South yeah. China Sea. And before you do undertake that row, I believe you have a little bit of a journey ahead of you. Yes, it's about 600 miles, a uh, thousand kilometers or so that I have to cover from Legazpi to uh, the, uh, this little port, Kurimao at the very northwest tip of Luzon Island. This gives me positional advantage. Uh, winds blow from the northeast and the currents tend to follow that. Uh, it's a very lively inner sea, the South China Sea. And also it will be very busy with uh, fishing vessels and traffic from say South Korea, Japan, east coast of China, all shipping back and forth all the goods that go through Suez Canal to the rest of the world. It's going to be a nightmare. So I need to deal with those and 
negotiate the currents. So wish me luck. All right. And I think you have your bike close by, your your ride. Yeah, the- uh, sure. let me quickly point my this is the bike. It's they lent it to me. It's a, essentially a mountain bike that I am going to take from here to uh, Ilocos Norte, they call it. So these are all the stuff that has been sorted. That's what I'm going to wear. This bag is going to get attached. I am in a mess here. All these excess will be stashed away. What I need will be on the uh, bicycle and the rest of it will I'll put away and stash into the, organize into the rowboat. So right now rowboat is not uh, properly, um, nothing has been properly stowed on the boat. Yeah. All right. So uh, one more image to share before we jump to Q&A and that is kind of the journey as a whole, the, the, the mission to circumnavigate the planet by human power, which uh, you've already done once. And so I mean, tell us a little bit about the journey as a whole. My uh, mission is to reach the highest summit on six different continents, except Antarctica, uh, get to these summits by human power and climb them. I have so far reached uh, Mount McKinley and Kilimanjaro and Kosciuszko in Australia. What remains uh, are... What remain are Everest, Elbrus, and Aconcagua. These summits are in memory of a friend that I lost while rock climbing together. His name was Joran Krop. He had bicycled from Sweden to Nepal in 1996 to climb Everest. And uh, when uh, he fell, that's when I decided life is short. I have to get on with my journey. So I completed a human power circumnavigation between 2007 and 2012 during which I also climbed Kosciuszko and Kilimanjaro. I had climbed Mount McKinley in 2003, May, after bicycling there from Seattle, towing my climbing gear just like Oran. So on this journey, my mission was to get to Everest and climb it. However, I don't have funding for that, so I'm going to have to skip that. It's a big cost item that I can't afford right now. And... uh, after Russia got to war in Ukraine, I don't think Elbrus is a safe place to go. It's inside Russia on the border with Georgia. So I don't know how that's going to play out, uh, but it's looking unlikely at this time. That means it's going to be an insanely long approach to Aconcagua in South America. <laughs> so once I get to Vietnam, uh, my plan is to bicycle starting tomorrow to Kurimao and get there at the end of this month on the 30th. I will hurry back and then we will load the rowboats on a flatbed truck and take her up to Kurimao. We're trying to figure out how we're going to take it off the truck. There is no crane or or a a decent ramp in Kurimao. It's a very small port. Uh, We will figure it out though until by the time we need to get there. And then I will launch once the weather allows across to Vietnam. Once I get to Vietnam, then the boat will be stored. Logistics will be handled. Uh, it will go into a warehouse, eventually in a container. And I will bicycle with another friend uh, all the way to Portugal. That's about 12,000 miles, just about 20,000 kilometers. And I need to get to Portugal before the end of September so that I can launch in season toward uh, Guyana. Uh, that map, that map there shows uh, landing at uh, Brazil, north shores of Brazil. Uh, my landing spot will likely be farther west from that, just above the equator. At British Guyana is more likely. We'll see how that works out. And Aconcagua would be the next summit if I can manage. All right. Well, it's an incredible journey and a complicated one with you know, world happenings and, uh, you know, climbing Everest uh, is a massively expensive undertaking, I think. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $60,000. It's not a... Yeah, even the cheapest ones will run thirty-five dollars to $40,000. What really is holding me back is even if I had that money right now, it's been such a grind that it would take at least a year of lead time to get all the 
equipment sorted and ready. And I can't just show up in Kathmandu and gather stuff in the local yeah. uh, bazaar, <laughs> use stuff and head up Everest. I'd be a statistic. That's just not the safe yeah. way to do it. And I'm yeah. not going to rush. There's no point in that. Um, so by the time I returned to Kurimao, I mean, uh, my starting point, Crescent City, it's likely going to be early 2025. Um, if I launched from Portugal early October of this year, I would get to Guyana uh, by February 24. I would have to wait for the season. That's the end of the season for Aconcagua. So I would need to go down to Mendoza and probably Nancy would join me there, my wife, and we could perfect our tango steps and <laughs> master our Spanish. Then when the season is right at the earliest opportunity, I could climb Aconcagua and work my way north to Crescent City. We'll see um, one day at a time in these things. All right. Well, we know one thing for certain is we absolutely plan to follow you along this journey, connect with you uh, wherever we can, because it's it's always amazing to hear about what you've been up to and, and what's coming up. So thank you so much for being with us today and sharing uh, the story so far. So I think it's time we switch gears and we start doing a little Q&A action. So if you are tuning in live uh, via YouTube. Use that chat sidebar. I can see a few classes have said hi already. We've got Miss Padberg's crew in Kansas City. We've got Miss Higgins' crew in Aaron, Ontario, so here in Canada. So let's start getting some questions in the chat. Say hi. Then let's start out with a couple questions from uh, our, our the camera class we have on right now. So we've got uh, Madame Christie's crew, grade six is in Niagara Falls. So I'm going to bring them in front and center. How are we doing today, Niagara Falls? There they are. Can you grab the mute for me? We can't hear you yet. Huh. Madame Christie, I don't I don't know why, but for whatever reason, it's off mute, but we still don't get the mic action. Uh, so no big deal. Do you want to use the private chat option and send us in uh, a question there? Or, or as many as you want, and we'll work those in. But we'll bring your class in to wave. Uh, and stuff as well. But while we wait for the, that first question to come in, Mr. Ferguson's crew would like to know, do you have a favorite place or favorite part of the voyage, the journey so far? Well, obviously, Philippines is the best place, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. where I am. In fact, it is a joy to be in the Philippines right now. Uh, tomorrow, starting tomorrow, I am going to have a group of young uh, entrepreneurs joining me all the way up to uh, Kurimao. And they will take me to the next city, Naga City, and then up the road like that. Uh, every stretch of the road, I'm going to have company and uh, different partners along the way. So it'll be a group activity and uh, I'm looking forward to this. All right. Awesome. I mean, it's a place I've always wanted to visit. I'm a scuba diver. So the, the, and you talking about the whale sharks, just, uh, got me really excited. So I hope you said it was February. So maybe you'll get lucky and you'll see a, a whale shark while you're out there. That'd be amazing. We'll see. Uh, all right. So Mrs. Cousins crew, they're in West Palm beach, Florida. Uh, and they're curious about the food aspect. Where does the food come from? How much do you need to pack in, uh, to the boat for this journey? I packed the boat up to the deck and all the holds below deck are full of extra food. I have plenty of food to make it across the South China Sea, which should take about three weeks at most. And then I should have excess for the Atlantic crossing even. I make a point of taking all the fuel that I need because fuel cannot be shipped as easily. A whole lot of fuel that is stashed in my boat and yeah, I'll make it across just fine. These are freeze dried foods in special packages. I use propane handheld stove to boil some water, which I make using a desalinator powered by my solar panel and batteries. <laughs> so yeah. the system is in place to make the water, boil it, add it into the pouches and they become edible and then that's my dinner or breakfast. 
Yeah. So it's kind of like astronaut food, freeze dried. Uh, you got to prepare it with the boiling. Uh, and then, I mean, you know, the, obviously this, this to Vietnam is a little bit shorter, roughly three weeks, but on those longer haul journeys, were you getting sick of that, uh, that freeze dried action or just happy for something to eat after a long day of rowing? You'd be surprised. These freeze dried foods are uh, really improved, have really improved in quality. So they taste just right uh, after a long day of work. And I do have some nuts and craisins and such to change the pace. Um, and uh, right. energy bars, chocolate bars, and stuff like that. Chocolate chocolate bars. Sure, sure. Those are all, yeah. those are all good. All right, let's bring Madame Chrissy's crew front and center again. There's some questions in the chat. And so this is from Everett. And Everett would like to know, uh, how many hours did you find yourself rowing each day? Well, typically I get started with daybreak and hang up my oars when sun sets. And I turn west to look for the green flash at the horizon. Oh, yeah. It's rare that I see it, but it is always exciting to look for it. To wonder if it's going to happen and uh it, during that time i'd say maybe 10 hours would be sitting at the oars and then the rest would be feeding myself and maybe messaging or whatever and at night i have an option to receive the winds in the seas from either port side or starboard side of the boat and that behave that changes the behavior of the boat which way it tracks and uh, typically the boat should be going with the seas and I should be able to control that. That's pr uh, somewhat predictable. And I plan my crossing in advance, uh, taking into account currents and winds and swells. And uh, my battle is to stay on the course that I designed from the start. All right. We'll keep those questions coming, Madame Christie's crew. I can see some more coming via the YouTube chat. So let's jump into that. Oh, Miss Padberg's crew, they're in uh, Kansas City, and they want to know, what's your favorite thing to eat in the Philippines? The uh, Philippines has... Uh... <laughs> Do you want exotic or... <laughs> yeah, hey, I mean, yeah, let's, let's go exotic. Exotic. How about balut? <laughs> it is... Uh... It's actually an egg with a growing chick in it. And they boil that before the chick, the egg hatches, the chick gets out of it. So, and then they number it, the number of days that it has actually incubated. Okay, and then sure. when uh, one breaks that open and eats it, uh, the bones haven't fir uh, firmed up yet. It is a very unique, experience it's like you're eating biting into cartilage um yeah i've had it once <laughs> all right and what about a little tamer what uh a little tamer uh, all, yeah. a lot of the foods that they have here have uh, coconut milk and other flavorings that i really enjoy and uh, those sauces go a long way they this area uh Bicol region this all by province is known for its hot peppers and they really like their food spicy much like i do so yeah i'm having a good time excellent all right well i mean that's kind of one of the best parts about visiting a different culture is immersing yourself trying the food uh so yeah definitely maybe a little wild for some of our classrooms to think about <laughs> but uh, i imagine it was an experience uh, okay, so Mrs. Richter's crew is hanging out with us. They're in Boynton Beach, Florida, and they want to know, do you do anything for entertainment on board while you're rowing? This time, I did not take any music with me. I decided I'm not going to worry about electronics like that. I had some books and uh, my iPad with some PDF uh, articles and white papers and other things that I wanted to peruse. So that was really my entertainment other than messaging back and forth with the team. Yeah. And I imagine power is kind of at a premium. You've got those solar panels, so there's a limited amount of power that you can generate each day. Actually, we improved my rowboat quite a bit before my launch, and uh -huh. I have 290 watts of solar capacity, solar panels, 
and that tops up my batteries uh, 100%, even in cloudy conditions. Before noon, it's 100% charged. So I have not suffered from power uh, shortage on this right. crossing. Uh, I'm very happy. Very cool. Uh, let's see. We've got another question here. This is from Miss Higgins, grade eight. And they're wondering, what's your motivation? What powers you uh, through this journey? This is from Addison. I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is from Addison. She's uh, with Miss Higgins, grade eight class. And she's wondering, what's your motivation? What kind of powers you through this journey? What keeps you going? Oh, motivation. That's a good one. I think uh, what motivates me is striving for a distant goal and lining up all my daily activities to get me there. So uh, it's a way of focusing all my energies, my time, my resources, funding, relationships, all of it. It's at times a sacrifice. So one has to accept to be alone. Um, but then the satisfaction comes from having achieved something that I have planned for so long and said it's a big goal to myself. I often say that uh, when I started my circumnavigation in 2007, I didn't know whether I could finish it. But by the time I did finish it in 2012, I had set 15 Guinness World Records and I had become the first person to have brought three oceans and first to have completed a solo circumnavigation by human power. So I had to become that person. It was a process of growth. And there is great satisfaction in that. Looking back, I say, yeah, of course I could do it. But I didn't know at the time. So that satisfaction, that uh, sense of accomplishment sure. stays with me for life. And yeah. uh, it's a demonstration of mastery, if you will, in the elements. And one can really learn from that. One can really cherish that. And I think I'll have great stories to tell uh, for the rest of my life. Well, I mean, there's no greater test of, uh, of yourself than kind of pushing yourself to those limits and, uh, you know, finding out what you've really got in the tank. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, 16 or 17 Guinness records later, uh, you've definitely got a, a bit in the tank there. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Madame Christie's crew, let's bring them back in here. A few more questions here. Um, so uh, one student's wondering if you were ever worried about sea animals, maybe bumping into the boat or tipping the boat over. So I wonder, you know, what did you see? Were there some sharks and things like that? Um, yes, I did see sharks. Uh, the sharks are in the water. I'm on the boat. As long as that's the case, there's no problem. Uh, if I would, if I were in the cabin and heard a sandpaper sound against the hull, that would be the shark rubbing against the bottom of the boat. Uh, if I heard a, a knocking sound like a door knock, that would be a sea turtle feeding on the barnacles under my boat. So, uh -huh. and then chirping dolphins. I had an idea about what was going on. I did. I was worried about whales, though. I was collecting ambient sound samples for beaked whales. I was dangling a hydrophone whenever the conditions were right. And uh, I was also at sea anchor uh, trying to manage the adverse swells that I was receiving during the winter short of Guam. All of these meant that I had lines hanging off the boat. And when there are whales around, they could tangle sure. and then take the boat on a ride. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I would hear, uh, if I was at per uh, anchor waiting, if I heard a whale exhale, any sound of the sort meant that I had to immediately rush out, check what was going on, and immediately gather the per anchor, get it out of the water so that it didn't get tangled and take me on a wild ride. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> that was just not an acceptable uh, option. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and one more question from uh, Miss Christie or Madame Christie's crew. They're wondering, you know, you talked a little bit about the strength and motivation, but was there ever a time where maybe you felt you got close to the breaking point? Oh boy, uh, 
Well, you know, it's all relative, isn't it? So uh, let me tell you about the last 72 hours of my approach to Lake Osby. I was trying to come into All by Golf. And the entrance to All by Golf is just north of the San Bernardino Strait, between Samar Island to our south and the Luzon Island, where I am now. And the currents run through there like a river. And there was a northeast wind blowing. And I had to stay away from Samar Island and line up with the entrance to All by Golf. And the last 72 hours meant that I had to stay awake for 40 hours straight and row to control the destiny of this rowboat until I got into the Albay Gulf. Then, uh, so quitting wasn't an option, really. Sure. Uh, uh, I then, of course, we had alternate plans. If I were sucked in there, what was I going to do? So I was trying to coordinate this with people on the, on the ground here. And then eventually I made it into All by Golf and I slept three hours in one hour increments with alarms set up ahead of time. And then I rode another 12 hours until I found the 50 meter mark, 165 feet or so, and dropped an anchor. And then I rode another four hours or so to make it to uh, Legaspi from there. Uh, so it, when the conditions demand it, there is no option. You just do what is to be done. Uh, but yes, uh, one episode where I thought I had had it was in Tanzania. It was the rainy season. I was bicycling and I came up on a road construction and this road construction had blocked the highway and they were letting all the traffic into a service road, which was a slurry a brown slurry, like chocolate milk, thicker <laughs> on the side. And I was trying to push my uh, bicycle with a trailer through that with trucks and buses coming and going. And I thought they were just going to uh, <laughs> bury me into that slurry and then uh, nobody was going to find out about me. And I thought about getting on one of these vehicles and getting out of there and then maybe returning later, who knows. But uh, I continued, I pushed another hour or two, and then eventually I found a break and I was able to take my bicycle onto freshly paved highway, no other traffic. And they had put piles of dirt on either end of it. It was about uh, 30 miles or so of highway, no traffic. There were puddles of rainwater that I could use to rinse all my socks and shoes and did the grime off my bicycle as well and then i had the highway to myself it was <laughs> if i see i had if i had had i quit i would have been i wouldn't even have known that there was this clean highway just for me yeah and it took me to the next town and i made it there by sunset it was amazing all right very cool there's a lesson, there's a lesson in there somewhere <laughs> yeah absolutely i think uh <laughs> you never know what's around the next bend <laughs> that's right uh, Miss Cousins crew are curious about your navigation. How are you kind of figuring out where you are? I am strictly using electronic devices. I have a chart plotter. I use GPS coordinates and uh, routing using chart plotter and electronic charts. If my main system fails, I have battery powered uh, chart plotter as well. Uh, Right now, uh, all devices have a way of telling what the GPS coordinates are, so it's not difficult to know where one is. Yeah. Um, yeah, chart plotter is the way to go nowadays. All right. Miss Brown's crew, uh, they're at grade fives in Guelph, Ontario. And so you talked about the sea creatures, you talked about the turtles, the sharks. They're wondering, was there any other encounters that you had? Anything else that stood out? Oh. I think flying I remember. I'm trying falling to... on deck. Yeah. Flying fish yeah. falls on deck. Uh, I have to clear the deck all the time when they are plentiful. The small ones are more numerous. Larger ones are less frequent. When I find a very... Uh, a, a large enough one that justifies cleaning it, I can clean that and add it into my breakfast. Just sitting in hot water is enough to get it to uh, cook enough so that I can 
peel the meat off the bone. Yeah. The, uh, there was one episode where I had a flying fish drop on the deck and I found it in the morning and in its mouth was a little shrimp. <laughs> so it was trying to hunt and got dropped on deck. Both of them died. All right. <laughs> Uh, I think I remember, too, one photo that you shared uh, past a big swordfish or a marlin, a big. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I that had a, a big I, fish. I saw I spotted a marlin on two occasions. I spotted uh, a whale shark once. Um, uh, there we as I was recording, I did see a. Uh, uh, I remember the encounter with a sperm whale. It was hanging out near me and I could kind of remember the shape of its nose, I should say, the front part. And uh, we identified that later as a sperm whale because of the sound recordings that I was doing during that time. And that's one of the episodes where I had actually the para anchor out and I had gathered it and this thing was around me few times it uh, yeah. made the loops around me so yeah all right well i think one final question as we're wrapping up here erden and this is coming from youtube and uh, i mean a tip a typical student question thinking about this big journey across the the world and being on your own for so much of it have you had any kind of dangerous or or near-death experiences <laughs> near-death experiences is uh riding a bicycle on highways uh, yeah. Every every vehicle is a steel missile passing by me at 60 plus miles an hour and uh, a distracted driver, it would be the end of me. So that's really the most dangerous thing that I do. Uh, everybody yeah. wonders if the oceans are more dangerous, but really not because I plan my crossings taking into account storm seasons and storm tracks and statistically speaking i should be safe i do it's a calculated risk it's never a gamble what i do yep. so i am prepared for various outcomes that some of which may not be as pretty <laughs> and uh, so experience helps in all of this preparation is a big deal uh, visualization ahead of time, uh, trying to figure out what could go wrong and being prepared for all of those is a necessity in what I do. Uh, but nature is somewhat predictable. I can plan for what it could actually throw my way. But humanity becomes less predictable on the journey. So as soon as I start engaging the crowds, humanity, the traffic, the risk yep. level goes up. All right. Well, Erdan, now that you're, I mean, obviously you have probably a busy night ahead of you, a little bit more packing uh, on the bike tomorrow <laughs> morning. Where are you going to have the tracker going this time around? Yes. If you would kindly share my website, yep. uh, HTTPS, uh, .com. Yep. On that website, I have a blog page, a tracking page, and other various information that's uh, that's up to date. And uh, your classrooms, the students can find more information there and have a way of following me. I think they will enjoy the com. I will enjoy the company. I think they will enjoy the information. All right, awesome. And then, so I don't know when we'll catch you next. Maybe after the bike ride. Maybe in Vietnam. But uh, either way, we're looking forward to it. Uh, and obviously everybody's wishing you a safe journey and we can't wait, uh, to follow along here. Very good. Uh, February 6th, we should load the boats from Legaspi and take it up to, uh, Kurimao, my launch point. So maybe early in February, we can have another session and then maybe a satellite phone session from the South China Sea and then definitely from Vietnam. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I want to give a big shout out to the classrooms. So many classrooms uh, tuning in on YouTube today and sending in great questions. So thank you for all those questions. Madame Christie's crew, our camera class hanging with us today. A big shout out to them. Thanks for sending in those great questions. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, Erdin, best wishes, good luck, and we can't wait uh, to follow along. Thank you. <laughs> all right.
Thanks, everyone. We are going to sign off for today.